Hello, Ambika Devi. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. I'm excited to talk to you. Hi, Shane. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. So, Ambika, you are a very interesting person. You're a coach, a mentor, a speaker, an author. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on, but... Oh, yeah. I, I've just added Lego Maniac to oh, it. Oh, that's interesting. What, what's yeah. that about? Um, I, I write for a magazine hmm. every month, and so that has a deadline. And with my own creative writing, I don't have deadlines. Sometimes I have goals, but uh, it's been a while since I've written for a periodical steadily. And a couple months ago, I hit a writer's block. On what you know, on my article, I think I had a paragraph up and not much more. Yeah. And I, after a week, I was starting to freak out, you know, because I it, the deadline's coming closer and closer. Yeah. And I had just started to be interested in Lego again, and I was talking to a friend of mine, who's a serious Lego user. <laughs> And, and a Lego head. player. I don't know. What do you call it? Lego user. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, of course, you know, wanted to get into it, but I needed a push. Mm -hmm. And so I was writing him messages and looking at all his stuff that he builds. And he's going, go for it, go for it. So I bought some little stuff, you know, easier stuff to build because I hadn't really done it that way. As a kid, I loved it, but I didn't follow directions. I just threw it on the floor and, you know, got played building. with it. Got yeah. Yeah, I got building. And so I knew that these new sets and everything were really involved and new pieces had come out, so many more than I imagined. And so I, I bought myself some and I bought some little sets and I bought a baby Yoda set that if you see videos of me, you often see them in the yeah. background. And yep, that's Yoda, that's, you know, Grogu and, uh, and he's built from Lego. And so I got so into it. it, it, it all came together and I whipped through the little stuff. And so I decided, Hey, I'm, I'm going to go for this. And I sat down and spent a weekend just building that. And as soon as I finished, I sat at my computer and whipped out the article wow. and it sparked me. I thought, Whoa, you know. Getting into a different part of your brain can unlock the part you might be struggling with. Yeah, it's true. You know, of trying to get a project done. And now I'm a devotee of, <laughs> of Lego. I mean, I'm building a giant Harry Potter commemorative thing. It has an owl, and I've finished a lot of it. Wow. It will end up in my background one day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just joyous, you know? So that's, yeah, that's yeah. my new addiction. Isn't it amazing how... <laughs> You know, when you're so stuck on something creative, like a, the writer's block or whatever it is, and then the solution is to distract yourself and do something else, not focus more in depth on, right. on the actual problem. It's very strange yeah. how that works, eh? I, I think I used to do stuff like clean the house, you know, the, yeah. the things that we don't do all the time like dust the little niggly places and, you know, yeah. clean behind the toilet, the top of the fridge. <laughs> and, uh, but this was better. <laughs> yeah. So, cause you get a yeah. nice cool result, yeah. right? You get this little exactly. model that you now can, you know, right. have and use. But then it also has the potential of impermanence if you want to break it apart and make something else from it. But with the bigger ones, I kind of like the sculptures. Yeah. But next, I'm going to get into portraits because I used to make portraits out of clay hmm. and I don't have a clay studio anymore. And I, they have a portrait maker, but I'm going to do them in bas relief. So they're going to have more depth to them. So we'll have to see what happens with that. That's awesome. So are those like 3D portraits, essentially. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. Whoa, that's cool. How, when, why yeah. did you stop doing that? You just found other stuff to do. Um, well, I moved, I moved across the country and it was a lot to take a clay studio. So I <laughs> yeah, sold it. Enough. Yeah. No, that's good. Tried to keep the smaller things. You know, what's interesting about like these Lego like hobbies or things where you kind of, they absorb your full attention, right? Is it's a very meditative experience, right? So meditative. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really great. And you don't even have to think or do anything to have it. You just need to want to do it and then start doing it and just keep going for as long as you want, right? I also like the Where's Waldo aspect of it because if you're following 
directions and you've spilled the bag of pieces out, you have to hunt yeah. and find that, that one. And it could be upside down or half under something. And so it also really stimulates that part of the brain. And yeah. I can feel the shifts, you know, when I locate the piece and... Ooh, the snap sound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very satisfying. Yeah, that's seeking Much better reward. than scrolling through, you know, Instagram and looking at rainbow squish. Yeah. I mean, it's a similar principle of like, you know, searching and finding and, you know, feeling that reward, but it's much more rewarding when you're doing it with something physical in front of you with a goal in mind rather than just like endlessly scrolling through the shit posts to find the one that you're like, oh, that one's quite cool. And then you get that little dopamine hit and then you move on. Right, right, right. right? <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's good to watch kittens or puppies or what you're into, but I think this is much better. Oh, yeah. No, build one. Don't get me you wrong. Know, build one. It, it's pretty hard <laughs> to stay off the internet with what's available mm -hmm. and especially how it's also curated to exactly what you want. Um, it's hard to, to get away from that, right? But then uh, when you do, finding something like Lego or painting or puzzles... Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a puzzle guy. They make me angry, but, you know, I'm happy to... <laughs> I do. I don't know why. Ever since I was a kid, I just can't do puzzles. I mean, like, I can do them, but for some reason, the process, it just makes me so angry. So I'm like, all right, I got other things to do. Right, I'll color. I don't have a table that that's, you know, you could do it on. So yeah. I like to play on the floor. Yeah. And I like to sit cross-legged, so that's out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would play, I, I'm not a hater like you are with puzzles, but um, but Lego's better. Yeah. I, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not a hater of puzzles in general. Like I'm perfectly happy for other people to enjoy and indulge and you know create these beautiful things. But for me, I'm just like, no, you do your thing. I'll I'll do. I'll sit over here and do mine. We can do Lego together though. So <laughs> that's a plus. Cool. Yeah, I think. I mean, like what you mentioned about all the creativities. So many people. Don't do it. Like I was talking, I, I have a dear friend who uh, I recently uh, co-led part of a workshop retreat, a virtual retreat that we did entitled Finding Peace. And he's an incredible counselor and he's a professor at ASU hmm. and he helps people with stress and PTSD and wounds and we were talking, his, his children just got involved in theater. And I grew up a theater kid. Hmm. And uh, we were talking about it and our experiences. And the idea of singing came up. And he said he used to love to sing. He actually wanted to pursue it. And he was squelched parentally to pursue something else. And trust me, he's great at what he does. So I'm partially happy about that but what made me sad yeah. is that he said he hadn't sung in a really long time so and this was this conversation was last night and hmm. i said to him if you sing me a song then i will pull out my ukulele and blow the dust off of it and i will record a song and put it on the internet so i did that this morning because nice. he he recorded four songs for me this wow. morning and i thought wow you know i was only hoping for one so i it's just we've got to inspire each other to stay creative. It's so challenging right now with what's going on in the world for many of us to remember, hey, I like to play. Yeah. I like to have fun. And it's such an important part of life, right? It, because Definitely. it's all about that curiosity and the play and the wonder and the just that freedom of expression in whatever it is that you're doing that you find pleasure in. I mean, singing is a great example. I mean, you don't even have to sing to an audience. You can just sing because it brings you joy to do it, right? Absolutely. You know, sing in the shower. Yeah. Sing while you're cleaning. I measure my level of happiness by if I catch myself singing throughout the day. Yeah. You know, like... I, I love music. I used to work as a musician. Yeah. And uh, I went through a period of time where I wasn't singing at all. And I really noticed it. And then I had to kind of force myself back into it. But now uh, I've been reconnecting with old friends and 
really making an effort because, you know, I'm not traveling and a lot of my friends are international. And so I, I've been making more of a focused effort on play. That's amazing. And have you been singing more? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I pulled out my ukulele and right. I put a song on Instagram this morning. <laughs> So you can go check it out. I manipulated the words, so I don't want anybody to get mad. But I was kind of, my intention was the song for my friend, but also I changed the words so it's for everybody mm -hmm. because I also want to spread more love and help people love themselves more and love each other. I feel like the current world situation is suppressing that. Yeah. And it's... It was my effort this morning to spread some love. No, and I'm sure it did to anyone who listened, right? I mean, you don't need much to have that inspiration just kick in and have a good feeling about it and start your day or end your day on a positive note, right? Instead of reading all the news about all the craziness that's happening or what you know people do to each other and all that nutty things that are going on in the world at the moment. It's like, that's exactly what, we need is more love and compassion for each other uh, for everyone you know not to say mm. only for these this group of people or that group of people it's like no you got, you can't do that like you got to it's got to be for everyone even if they're not yeah. feeling it for you so much right and that's the hardest one part one tribe it it annoys me that that people are you know like i'm part of this tribe i'm part of that tribe it's like we are one tribe we're actually one being yeah. just one being you know we're all interconnected by an invisible web and i always make an effort to refocus people's attention to love self because that's you loving everyone and love everyone yeah and the, even people who don't love you back, right? Like that's the, the important part of it is like there's no division between us and them. There's just us. Mm. It's all of us. Well, the mind likes to go into duality, Shane. Yeah. You know, it likes to, it, it goes, I like it, I don't like it. And that's, as a yogi, it's my focus to find equanimity in a non-judgmental non place that is a witness mm -hmm. and experiencing but non-reactive. This is this is the the challenge of yoga. Yeah, I know. Everybody on the internet in their, you know, slick spandex or whatever fiber they're wearing and doing Cirque du Soleil moves and then putting a tiny bit of yoga wisdom. Come on. Yeah. That's yoga exercise, but one of my teachers said one time uh, it, with regards to these social media posts of yoga, of yoga postures. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. I'm an advocate of the exercise. I do it on a regular basis. But I wish I could see more people doing breathing exercises mm -hmm. or proper voice uh, use so that this is a major part. But the teacher said to me, if... If uh, contortion, which this is contortion type movement, if contortion made you happy or, or if contortion, no, if it, contortion brings enlightenment, then there will be a whole lot more happy circus performers. Right. <laughs> That's true. It's a good one. You know, man. circus performers are not happy people. I actually, uh, in one of my bands, I hired a guy who had left... Uh, Cirque du Soleil and mm. he had to detox he you know he was not happy and I used to be a Cirque du Soleil addict when mm. I lived in Arizona because they would come in the desert and set up these inflatable theaters that were so cool yeah and I I, I bought like a VIP membership I went to every show when they would come to the desert and uh and then I was at a show one time uh, I forget which one it was. Forgive me, everybody. But this violinist was hanging from the ceiling playing. And I was like, oh, my God. I turned to my friend. I was looking for somebody for a trio I was putting together. And uh, I said, that's the kind yeah. of violinist I would like to find. And he, he got fired hmm. after that show. And he contacted me. And I ended up making a band with him for a while. Whoa. And he was not happy. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's crazy. But what a cool He's story. He's happier now, right? everybody. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> he came out on the that other just, side. That just proved, you know, that kind of dawned that phrase to me when the teacher said, uh, you know, I just put it all together. I thought, yeah, you know, I did meet Cirque du Soleil players because they were staying in a hotel right around the corner from where I lived and I would run into them mm. at the gas station all the time. And they did not look like happy people. And that made me sad because that theatrical show brings so much joy to so many people. Yeah. That it's sad to me that the performers aren't finding joy in their performance. Yeah. And I think you see it a lot with all kinds of performers, right? Is that you, particularly because with performances, you get to see what they choose to put out there, right? Not the whole person and everything that they're going through. I mean, it depends on the art and the performance, right? But in every situation, like you can see, like in music, you know, there's always stories about the most, you know, quote unquote, successful musicians or artists or bands that, you know, are, you know, they, they can't, uh, I mean, you know, they, they suffer all kinds of things and they, they have all kinds of addictions and, um, you know, like and mental health. And sadness yeah. and health problems. I mean, when I read about Lady Gaga, yeah. I, you know, I was, uh, it's shocking. Yeah. It's really shocking. But I know I, I went through time as a performing musician where I didn't feel well, but while I was playing, yeah. I was blissed and I had no pain. So I understand, but it is, it is sad. And then, so when I played the song this morning, Shane, I said to myself, I'm not going to make, you know, like a studio set up and pretend I'm perfect. My hair was mussed up. I was wearing, you know, my pajama look of the morning. (laughs) And, you know, I was just having some coffee and uh, I, I was just being me. Yeah. I wish, you know, I wish these coaches would just be them. Yeah. You know, stop with the slick Canva images and just be you for goodness sake. And that's what really inspires people, right? And draws them in is the authenticity of it. Um I it draws me in. Yeah. I can't speak for everybody else, but yeah. No, it's true. And I think that like I, I'd mentioned this on a, a previous episode, I can't remember which one. It was such a great discussion about how like musicians are often produce their best work before they become super successful because the only thing that they're doing is they're dedicating their time and, and life to their music, right? And expressing themselves as they would and as they would want to um, and, and not being hindered by all the politics of the music industry or the art industry or whatever it is. Oof, which That's a topic. <laughs> which, yeah, which comes in with the success, right? And, and changes everything because there's all these you know, directives and and opinions and people trying to make more out of whatever it is and guide into, you know, whatever it is instead of just, you know, embracing that authenticity that's there in the beginning, right? And it's not to be blaming or or saying it's an industry problem or whatever it is. It's just that's kind of how it works sometimes is like when there's just that pure drive and intention in the beginning – that's when the real like emotion and value like comes through, right? Um, Most definitely. But it's a fascinating topic, and and I think that you know you see more of it now because of the way that social media works and how we can stay connected with artists on a sort of like day to day basis, and you see a lot more of the life than you would have thirty or forty years ago, where you would just get the music album and that was the end of it. Maybe an article or two in a paper or a magazine, but you, there's no connection to the person, whereas these days you can be connected to the, the person and you get to see it in a lot more detail. It's an interesting like evolution um, of an industry, right? Um, mm. For good and for bad, because it doesn't always work out so well. And it also comes with yes. a lot of negativity and hate and that kind of stuff, which 30 or 40 years ago you wouldn't have got because... <laughs> How were people going to tell you that they didn't like you? They couldn't just tweet mm. at you or whatever it is. Um, yes, art for art's sake. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's the process. It's the creativity. It's it's when you're in it. It's not the end product. Um, you know, the end product is equivocal to what you digest and poo out. <laughs> <laughs> That's just. 
yeah. you know, but it's, it's while you're in it and, and experiencing it and it's joyful. And it's that inner child that needs to do this. You know, it needs yeah. to experience. It makes me so sad when I ask a client, what's your creative outlet? And they have zero or they tell me golf or mm -hmm. tennis. And I say, well, that's great that you exercise and that's exercise, but that's not creative. Yeah. And I've had some pretty high end clients who couldn't identify this. I actually wrote a, a story about it in my first book about a Fortune 500 client whose wife came to me crying because her husband was miserable. And he owned, he owned one of the top five companies at the time at Fortune 500. Think about that. Mm. Think about the zeros, yeah. right? Everybody's pushing zeros on your bank account. That's not going to make you happy or healthy. And she was crying and she came running up to me. It was before the gig started. I used to, I used to work at gigs um, uh, reading tarot cards. Mm. Because I was a drummer and a singer, and that's not a great solo act for corporate parties. Yeah. So I, I said to one of my agents, because I worked for multiple agents, that's another thing in the business. People don't understand if you get at that level, you're, you're just being pimped out by everybody. Yeah. And it's, it's hard. Uh, I'm sure, yeah. So, so uh, she came running up to me, and I, it was a very, it was like a summit, you know, for these Fortune 500 people at a really high end resort in Scottsdale, Arizona. She came running up crying before the gig because they actually invited me to eat, which was rare. Like, why aren't you feeding your performers, everybody? Yeah. That's sick. Give them water. They wouldn't <laughs> even give water at some gigs. You had to bring your own stuff. And they're That's eating crazy. and drinking. It's, you know, this is worse than indentured servant. And uh, she said, well, could you please help my husband, please? And I said, absolutely. He can be my first. And I'm sitting there with a plate of food. And she said, great. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, you know, he's he's got everything. He's got perfect, gorgeous children. She showed me pictures of them. They were, you know, they were like J. Crew perfect. Yeah. And uh, she was gorgeous. She was model perfect. And she was sweet. And we've got houses, boats, you know, all the things. And he's unhappy. He's depressed. And, and I wrote the little bit of the story about him in my first book, Lilith. Uh, which is a novel, but as you can tell now, it's got a lot of true stories from my life in it. Yeah. And I, I asked him, you know, what do you, what's your creative outlet? And he said golf. And I mean, it was crickets. I, I, I had to then spend most of my time explaining to him what a creative outlet is. Mm -hmm. And he owned a publishing company. Yeah. <laughs> Books, people. Yeah. What is wrong with this picture? Well, I guess it's like people also tend to, you know, not at their own fault, but sort of in, in the world we live in, you tend to sort of label people as creative or non-creative, right? You're either a creative thinker or you're a rational thinker and you should deal with numbers and things like that. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, it, it's a false dichotomy of, of thinking that creativity is something you either do have or don't have, right? It's It's about the outlet is not, for a, a purpose other than just to be creative and express yourself right i mean I, I was thinking about it the other day just along the same lines i was like music is interesting like why do we listen to music so much and how come it touches us at such a deep level right in ways that you know n nothing else quite does i mean may maybe mm. art for some people like um mm -hmm. paintings and things like that um, maybe poetry is an early version of it, but I think music today is mostly just like our version of poetry, right? Um, and it, it's an expression are, are you, for your soul, right? Well, are you talking about just the instrumental aspect of music or the word aspect of music? The, because well, I, I think both. if we look, yeah, if we look at the, just the music, if yeah. we look at instrumental music, every sound has a frequency. Mm hmm Every frequency potentially is a light wave, mm -hmm. right? It has a light, a color. We only have a brief bit of that, a small bit that us of the spectrum that we can I identify and see. I think this is why so many people are going to um, plant medicine because it opens up and cleanses out the pineal gland, mm -hmm. 
which has a great deal to do with the way we can register information in the brains. And so if we look at the work of Dr. Emoto, are you familiar with that? With water, right? Yeah. And and the different snowflakes and then the icky looking stuff when there's when there's uh, negativity placed in the water. Uh, then music is creating all this incredible kind of yantra is what we call it in Sanskrit. Yantras are painting images of sound. You're right. So each of those is a sound. And some of them can become 3D. They, they all can become 3D sculptures. So music is, is very healing. And I, I worry a lot. Uh, look, I used to be a drummer. Mm. I won't go near a drum circle. I, it's, it's toxic to me. I can't get near them. If I hear them in the distance, I go the other way. They hurt me because they're disharmonic to me. They're discordant. Mm. If I'm playing, and okay, maybe I'm a music snob because I got to play with some incredibly great people. Sure. Like I was in a big, I was in a big band with Lyle Lovett's drummer, and we had such a connection. I'm playing percussion, he's playing kit, and we just like this exchange of energy rolling back and forth between us. And hmm. sometimes I would just tune out uh, the horn section and the lead singer and just listen to the rhythm section. But we were very much in tune and together. So when I get near stuff that's just going, it's like vomit to me. I can't handle it. Yeah. Forgive me, drum circle people. I know it's unlocking stuff in your lower chakras for you, and that's great. But I don't want to come play. Please yeah. forgive me. No, that's fine. And to each their own, right? I mean, yeah, um, I mean, they're expressing themselves, and yeah. I'm happy for you, but I need more refined harmony for me. Yeah. That doesn't mean when I play my ukulele, I'm that great. Remember, I'm a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> I can screw up big time, yeah. but I just let it slide, you know, because it's joyous to me. Yeah. No, it's true, and, and it does. And, and, you know, that distinction between, like, the sound versus, I mean, an instrumental versus a voice addition is interesting because you don't actually need voice to have that music have that impact on you mm, um no and that's absolutely yeah. not and you can see it like well for me it, it's most evident in like classical music right where you can listen to a piece of something and it, you know it, you can feel like a, a journey of emotion even though you don't quite understand it or can put words to it because mm. it, it's a little bit just ethereal in nature right mm. um whereas with words there's a more of a clear directive of like what the story is and what it's trying to tell you. But even then, it's so open to interpretation um, of the individual listener that what the writer who wrote the lyrics or the lyricist, I suppose, is a more technical word, like what they intended to come through, which was sort of their own self-expression, doesn't need to be the same as what people hear and receive when they're listening to it, right? Yeah, I think that's, you know, the whole idea of ballet. Yeah. Because ballet music is, is the music that was written for all of these, you know, classical ballets. You could close your eyes at the ballet and go on a journey easily. I think that's why a lot of people kind of fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> there you know, I, when you're sleeping, you're still taking it in. You're still taking in the sound, you're taking in the vibrations. And uh as a as a teacher, as a professor, I never, ever got angry at a student for sleeping during a class. Whereas I, as a student myself, once leaned my head down on my desk, and it, I think it was it was during math, maybe, hmm. and I love math. It was, Maybe not. I don't remember what it was <laughs> during, but my teeth, and I was in the back row, not a big classroom, but maybe about 25, kids at the most and my teacher wailed an eraser at me and it smacked me right in the in the forehead that's nice and i was humiliated yeah what a and, i mean that was abuse man that's crazy yeah but it happens <laughs> yeah. a lot you know that was in eighth grade it was impactful yeah i have i obviously still have a bit of a wound over that yeah <laughs> you know no for sure and listen it's got good aim that teacher too unbelievable <laughs> aim 
unbelievable aim. That's like, I think all the kids whip their heads around because they, you know, yeah. they can see it from the front milliseconds before it whacked me in the head. And, and I mean, it hit me smack in the head. My head was on this. I can't even figure wow. out the logistics of that. It's terrible. That toss. <laughs> yeah, pe- yeah. People do crazy things. And, uh, you know, you wonder how they, they get into the, the profession and stay there with stuff like that. But I mean, that's really the tip of the iceberg of what happened back in the day, you know, with And that teachers. just got let slide. Like I didn't, I didn't report it, yeah. you know, I just, I just tried never to lean my head down yeah. in this class again. <laughs> Listen, I mean, from one perspective, the disciplinary action worked, but it's not the right way to do it, right? Just like you can hit, no. like you can hit animals into obedience, but you don't really want to be doing that. It's not good. Or children, mm, for that I think matter. chimes or gongs would be more appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because they cleanse the air. That's, you know, the, the vibrations of bells and chimes. These, these all are cleansing. Yeah. They're very, very cleansing. And they also radiate. The, the way those uh, particular instruments, you know, have their um, extended... Uh, what would you call that? I can't even remember Resonance? the musical term. You know, the trail. No, I'm, I'm, it doesn't matter. Somebody will correct me. Yeah. Look, <laughs> There's always editors out in the world. And uh, got, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, go ahead, ring things. them, ring them. Tingsha, yeah. Wait, let me do it by the microphone. <laughs> oh, you know what? Shane, let me teach you something. Yeah. When you hit them, spin them slightly. Okay. After they, after they hit together. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, that's that's the real because then you're manipulating the waves even more. Yeah, the resonance. Yeah. You know, I guess it's the resonance. Um, that's awesome. And so all this music, and and then as a drummer, look, we know from historical information that drums were used as communication. They were used to drive armies. Yeah. And uh, drumming is very very sacred to me. So I'm very very careful about. Any words I would use with drumming, any thoughts I am having while drumming. Mm. Do you find because, yourself not thinking when you're drumming? No. Uh, well, going into a meditative state, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Just witnessing. But I, if I'm playing any kind of drum, I'm thinking love before I start. And when I was in bands, and trust me, I've been in everything from uh, reggae to big band to pl- <laughs> I was once uh, in a reggae band till two in the morning. Hmm. Stay would would go home, try and take a two hour nap, get up, have breakfast, and then drive to a Jesuit church to play in a Christian band uh, at six o'clock in the morning. Wow! So and it's quite the contrast. Know, not my religion at all, but hey, it was a gig. It was a gig with a jazz pianist that I played a lot of jazz gigs with. Yeah. And all I had to do was take a pair of bongos. It was an easy gig. Nice. So, and where we sat, we were we were right across. This is a beautiful church in Phoenix, Arizona. And where, where the band alcove was, it was like set out of view for the pews. And I was sitting right across this big red stained glass window that had a giant pentagram in it. So... I think that kept me fascinated for a while yeah. <laughs> until I said to her, all right, I'm done. I can't do this anymore <laughs> after several months. That's interesting. I've never seen, well, I haven't been to many ter- churches, I suppose. I come from a- yeah, from I found a, it very fascinating. Yeah. Um, I come from a Jewish uh, background. And so I suppose I've been- Me too. I've been in like three or four <laughs> churches in my life. And I suppose I've been in many in a, like a museum kind of context, um, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. touring Oh, you mean and just stuff. like walking in to look at the art? Yeah. Um, yeah, I love doing that. Yeah. I love doing that. Some of them are so beautiful, like the cathedrals, oh, and yes, you know, it, it's magnificent. I mean, there's some good Jewish ones too. Um, you know, oh the yeah, synagogues. the synagogues. Yeah. There's, there's one shaped like a Mexican hat. You know, like the <laughs> like a in, sombrero. In, yeah, yeah, a big some. Well, it's it's more like when you fold it out of newspaper when you make oh, hats okay. uh, out of. Uh, forgive me for saying Mexican hat. Was that slanderous? Gosh, cut that out <laughs> and. <laughs> Forgive me, that's, everybody. That's where I, you find the hats. But, but yeah, um, yeah, sombreros, right? Um, but it's a it's a really unusual sculptural piece of architecture in 
Scottsdale. I think it, it might be Phoenix. It's like right near the line. Mm. So go look it up because you can find pictures. The glass in there is amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, mm. it, it's fascinating. And, you know, people like architecture itself is is also a fascinating field. And I think we've lost a lot of that in the modern world of like beautiful architecture with our big skyscrapers. Oh. I mean, sometimes yeah, you yeah. see ones that are, you're like, wow, that's a really cool design. Right. With the with the cupola domes yeah. and the the antennas. I mean, um I was recently watching I just recently watched a series of videos on YouTube uh that had a lot about ancient architecture. Mm. And uh don't I'm gonna tell you the title. Sure. <laughs> but don't don't let it throw you. I was uh it, it's called The Lost History of Flat Earth. Okay. <laughs> And I, I got, I have a friend who has a podcast who's been interviewing a flat Earth guy, which led me to an astrologer guy, which led me to a book from the 13th century. So that's that it's rabbit hole. I have journey. lots of rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, uh, I gave a video to a, another astrologer friend. Who we discuss astrology and mysticism and uh, ancient Far Eastern styles mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, and I uh, gave him that video and then he gave me the lost history of flat earth. And the first section has all this information. Well, it keeps going through the whole uh, video about the ancient architecture. And is it really what we think it is? And was it really built when we think it was? Mm. By whom we've been told. Right. You know, so I found it fascinating. And now that we have drones... I don't know. Did you see the drones all fell out of the sky during a celebration in China yeah, yesterday? Yeah, I saw that. That was wild but and bizarre. Those drone shows but are something else, eh? I, I imagine, but that one was spectacularly yeah. going wrong. Massive malfunction. <laughs> because of the drone imagery, and then also in recent years, there was a couple years of drought in the UK, and they're discovering so much more like Stonehenge that's right. buried under mud. And it got me thinking, like, I've always, I don't know about you, Shane, but what's up with the Easter Island heads? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, wow, that's deep in the earth. That's deeper than you need, you know? Yeah. And in this video, he was talking about uh, mud liquefying and burying. And it took me also to a trip that I made years ago, more than a decade ago, to Greece. Mm. Um, because I am a huge fan of architecture, and as an astrologer, I had to travel to Greece because I practice tropical astrology, which is Greco-Roman. And I was in Chania on Crete, or Crete is the <laughs> proper way to say it. And I was uh, walking around. I had, you know, just free time that day, as I was with a group. And I was walking around, and I was looking at these residential houses, but they were their first floors didn't make sense. They were kind of like they are in Savannah, Georgia, where the steps to the first floor go up and then there's kind of a sub basement. Mm. But these weren't intentional sub basements. They had been excavated and they had placed glass in so you could see sometimes beyond one story down. That's now cool. why would a residential building be built on another residential building that went stories into the earth? Like, I don't just know. Just think about that for a second. And they had glass windows and they would display what they had uncovered, you know, items and artifacts. And it was quite obvious looking at it. It was just mud. It wasn't lava that they were excavating. Now, where did that mud come from? Because Hania is right on the coast. Mm. It always has bugged me. And then when I watched this video, it really made me go, hmm you know, yeah. of what the heck is going on here? Suspicious. And how, uh, how did we generate light before? There's footage, there's, there's film footage, black and white film footage of moving sidewalks in the 1800s in this video with bright light. What do you mean? You'll have to see the video. Like moving sidewalks like you have at airports. Yeah. Outdoors with bright lights all around filmed in the 1800s. Filmed in the 1800s. Or late 19. I might be misquoting, but... I mean, early 1900s, oh, right. but... Wow. I think it was I think it was late 18. I'm pretty sure it yeah. was it late 18. It I, could be. I watched it a couple weeks ago. And the lighting, you know, like like the glass structure 
that that's in the UK that was the had the big um display of all the different culture and botany sure i just there's some of this you know that was made before there were glass factories how yeah it's a good question i have no idea (laughs) i i have a lot of questions about this everybody so if you want to get into it with me you can find me on social media and start barking at me i'd be happy to debate hopefully they have some answers for you i'd rather i'd rather hear some solutions yeah no it is fascinating and Particularly when you look at like ancient architecture and you study the like geometry of all of it and how perfect it all is. And, you know, I've been to the, the pyramids in Egypt and um, ah. it's, it, it's, it's just a different story to be there because, I mean, I was there on a day when it was like 50 Celsius and everyone was just Ooh. dying, but you oh stand gosh. there. Well, listen, it's a desert. What do you expect? Right. right. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Went in summer. It was a big mistake. Um, but you stand yes. next to these <laughs> these these buildings that are just unbelievable, and each stone is the size of like houses or buildings, and it's just it's hard to imagine how any of it got done with how we think mm-hmm. about the ancient world, right? Um, I mean, I know there's lots of theories about the construction and the ramps and all this kind of stuff and whatever, and there's also some co- right and rolling things on yeah. logs and yeah, rope. Yeah, and there's and I'll, I'll, I'm interested. I like the alien versions. I think it's fun. I do too. Yeah. I'm with you, Shane. Um, you know, high five, high yeah. ten on that one. <laughs> totally, a big hug rather. Right. Yeah, it's like, please. I I climbed the pyramid at Chichen Itza before they shut it down. Mm. I haven't been to Egypt yet, but I uh, got close. I was in Israel. Yeah. In nine, right after the war, right, right after the yeah, which war? In the sixty in which the sixties. Which was that? The Seven Day War. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, Moshe Dayan was on my plane there. Oh, that's cool. And we got delayed 14 hours in New York leaving. I was a little kid. And uh, yeah, that was, that was, I saw a lot of great architecture. They were mm. excavating. They had just recently found King Solomon's temple uh, or castle. I, and I don't remember. Uh, yeah. Whether it was castle or town. I think it was castle. And I had to ride a donkey up. Yeah. To look down into the excavation, which had become a mountain. Yeah. Like, how oh, that got covered up? Well, okay, sand blowing, but it didn't <laughs> look like sand only. And so, yes, in this video, again, there's all these drone shots of places like Versailles and cities like in the Netherlands. And and you can see that they are yantras. Mm-hmm. They are designed. And the way the water was meant to flow around them and canals and waterways and the way fountains were run without electricity or pumps. Yeah. Uh, and water, I truly believe water was being used for making vibration, which generated things like light. Hmm. Yeah. I mean. That's okay. Th- I could sci- be a nutter. I no, don't know. But yeah. There you is know, science I, to it. Is, it's just uh, yeah. difficult to know because all that information has been lost over thousands of years for whatever reason. Right, and so right. It, it's so important for us to think about our own vibration, our primordial sound, mm-hmm. and what we're uttering in words and creating in thought and learning to use the power of our own voices and even visualization. Yeah. Because I used to teach, I used to teach visual art to kids that had no sight. I taught at a school for the blind. Whoa. And I taught kids visual art. I was assigned this when I was a senior in art school and I was learning to be an art teacher and I, I was sitting around a boardroom table and our master teacher is handing out our final projects of six weeks of going out into a school and actually teaching with a master teacher and everybody's getting their assignments and they're all happy. You know, this one got the gifted school for painters and, and it comes to me And I get assigned the school for the blind and I started crying, Hmm. you know, I just was like, oh my gosh, how how is this happening to me? Yeah. And I stayed after class and my teacher, who was one of my favorite teachers, he actually was the very first person that I ever experienced a creative guided meditation style visualization with live okay you know he had us lie on the floor and he would and now i do that i have a podcast where (laughs) i do that for free right called meditate with ambaka and i i know that it's so relaxing and such a great way to 
visualize and tune into your imagination. Is it meditation? Well, it can trigger you into it, but it itself is not meditation. Mm -hmm. It's a potential launch point. And, and he said, you know, you're the only one out of this group who could handle this. And then I went and my master teacher, Susan Rodriguez, was amazing. And she was it, also what he told me is she's writing a book and you'll be the perfect assistant for her. So and this was a public school in Philadelphia. Hmm. It's not a lot of funding. And this school thankfully put a lot of funding into lunch because lunches there were great. <laughs> they actually made homemade soup and had homemade food. How rare is that anymore? Yeah, and, unheard of these days. But unfortunately, the art department did not have a lot of funding. I mean, I had brown paper towel mm. as drawing paper. And I, I actually had to scavenge and made really good friends with the maintenance department to help find things. And I created, so what she wanted me to do, she was writing a book called The Special Artist's Handbook. Hmm. And she took art projects from the most challenged of beings to the most gifted of beings for the same project. And I was researching, developing, and creating tools for these kids who had no sight. And some of them were profoundly in the, they, they couldn't hear. Some of them were autistic. It was really intense. Hmm. And, but I had these fourth graders who were the gifted art kids. These were all lower school kids. Yeah. And I made things like drawing boards for them by taking uh, cardboard, like thick cardboard or masonite and wrapping window screen around it and taping it off on the back with duct tape, you know, Thank goodness for the maintenance guy. Yeah. I wish I could remember his name. And I would put thin, like, butcher paper. Thank goodness I managed to talk the school into a roll of butcher paper, or maybe Susan did. And, yeah. and I'd put the butcher paper over it so they could feel the screen through it. And then I gave them thick crayons to draw on. And I taught them geometry. Whoa. And we had markers that had scent, mm. but crayons all smell alike. Yeah, it smells like crayon. And we would talk about color in other times with the markers. But when we were, when I said, "Okay, we're going to draw with crayons," and they said, "How are you know how are we going to do it?" And I said, "I made these for you," and I gave them. And darn, if those kids couldn't pick up a crayon and say. Is this a yellow crayon? And they got it right. Is this a blue crayon? And they got it right. Wow. You know, it makes me cry still yeah. to think about that because they were so beautiful and they felt and, and could inner see so much more. And what we're doing to society is just killing that in people. Yeah. It's wrong. Wow, I should have brought tissue over yeah. here. <laughs> To my desk. <laughs> no, it's good. But that it's a tremendous story, that, because, you know, you wouldn't think that you could even do that with kids right. or people who are blind, um, you know, have them do art, or at least not that it would be of any value, but that's not, obviously, it's not the case, right? And it just no, takes I someone mean, I who cares. I taught them so many things. I taught them how to weave. And I created, and, and much of what I developed is in the book. And then I lost touch with Susan. And then last year, when the pandemic started, uh, I, I've been in a writing group mm. uh, for a couple years, and we're called the Scrivener's Coven. It's a women's writing group that a friend of mine, Rusty LaHaye, started. And uh, one day we got, uh, we write from prompts, so quotes from other people's writing. And uh, sometimes even from our own books, you know, we'll use a prompt from each other's books. And there was a prompt and I thought I was going, I was writing about my family, but this prompt and this prompt led me over to my bookcase where I have uh, some photo albums. And I was flipping through a photo album, looking for something specific, uh, an old picture from my family growing up. And I came across pictures of these kids. I still have pictures that I took of them, old Polaroids. Wow. And I sat and looked at it, and I had my I had my journal with me, and I sat there writing. I went past the point where everybody got back together on the screen. I got back with them, and I read what I wrote, and it was about Susan. It was about this experience. And 
they encouraged me, go look for her. And I found her during our session. We were in a weekend retreat. And so the whole process of me going from the first quote to finding the kids to writing this piece and then finding Susan and I found her on Facebook and she wrote back to me during the weekend. Amazing. And we've reconnected. It's just wow. wow, You know? Yeah. Wow is the right word to to use. It's uh, that's really special, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure what an impact that you and her and Susan must have made on those kids, right? Because who else was going to give them that kind of time and opportunity and just care to... Yeah, and she's a great painter. Yeah. Great painter. And she teaches at university level uh, painting hmm. and her compassion. I learned so much compassion and patience from her. Yeah. And I also learned that we cannot judge people by what we think we see. No. We have to allow ourselves to open up and let them unfold like a flower to us. Yeah. And you never know what people are really going through, you know, just by looking at them. It's really uh, yeah. everyone's on their own journey and have their own struggles and no one is better or worse off uh, just at a glimpse, you know. Yeah, I think, you know, we're so into goal setting and contests. And if I make something or I create something, it has to be good enough to be judged. Yeah. And what I want to encourage everybody to do is just do it for the sake of doing it and get into the process. Yeah. And if you do make something that you like and you want to give it to somebody as a gift, great. But if you don't, it's okay, yeah. you know, because you enjoyed the process. And I've done a lot of pursuit of trying to find techniques over the years. I've been researching meditation towards a PhD. I don't know if I'll ever receive it. I had to let go of that idea after six years and uh, in meditation. And it led me to discover something called Zentangle. And I I love it because it's little three and a half by three and a half cards of paper. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can do it. People are doing it on walls and all over and making mandalas and things like that. But what my idea was, here's something you could carry in your purse or your pocket, right? And you could stand in line. And I've done this, like standing in line at a bank, like Zentangling, because it was a long line. Yeah. And... uh, It's great because even a very first time beginner can create something that they look at and go, wow, that's actually cool. And it's not about the product because it's a meditation for me, for the way I teach it. Yeah. So what do you do on the cards? How does that work? Well, what they've done is they've broken down geometric kind of doodling into single stroke by stroke. Hmm. And and it becomes a process of building like Lego. Like you don't need a map. You can easily create on your own. And it is a meditation. It's calming. It helps calm the mind and calm the body down and refocuses you. So it's it's takes the idea of doodling. I think, ha- haven't we all doodled something? Yeah. Even if it was just a scribble. Or, you know, playing tic-tac-toe or like when I was a kid, not in that teacher's class that threw the eraser at me, but other teacher's classes, I would play a game called dots yeah. where you would make a square field with dots and then you would each pass it back and forth and make the next line, the next line. So it's that kind of an idea. That's amazing. Yeah. And, I'll show and you. then you can get really intricate. I'll show you my doodles in my little notebook. Yeah. Oh man. See, you're a tangler. <laughs> you're totally a tangler. That's a color one. I, nice. I just uh, do whatever's going. I mean, they're definitely not very good, but I don't care. <laughs> I just do it. Oh, they're for beautiful! Me. <laughs> don't kid yourself. I think they're beautiful. Thank you. But so, do they you, show a lot of passion? Do you buy a kit, or can you do it just on um, a piece of paper? You can. You can. How does it work? Well, uh, the thing is, I actually went away and uh, to to a workshop and became a certified Zentangle teacher. Oh, cool. So they do have a, what they call the CZT program. And, uh, but there's, there's Zentangle teachers all over the world. There's people that do virtual classes, um, Mm. 
it, at, at some point I may host some virtual classes. I've been doing so many other things, yeah, you know, like we were talking like about <laughs> the audio and video editing can take hours and then I'm writing my fifth book. But uh, at some point I would like to host a little bit. I used to host in person. Mm-hmm. There was a farm to table restaurant and I used to do happy hour, like wine and uh, appetizer Zentangle classes. Oh, that's cool. And it was really fun because we'd all sit around this giant table and I I included all the supplies. There are particular supplies that are used, but you don't have to. You know, there are uh, Zentangle has its own brand. Yeah. They have what's called the Primer book, which is the beginner book, which explains some of the history of it and how they developed it and then gives you all kinds of reticular kind of imagery mm. that you can reproduce and make things out of and then all you have to do is hashtag zentangle and you will find enough to keep you in a rabbit hole for the rest <laughs> of your life that's funny yeah no that's cool what a great little like uh way to you know just be creative and meditative on the spot anywhere you go right uh, mm. you just need a pen and a little piece of paper or just to calm you down yeah. when I, I you know i'm a schoolaholic shane like serious schoolaholic i have multiple college degrees <laughs> got a master's been working on a phd i have had multiple creative careers uh i include teaching in that yeah. i've taught everything from kindergarten to university i've taught uh, at in that i've taught yeah. art music dance and also meditation yoga and uh, and and then holistic health. I was a holistic health practitioner, wow. uh, serious, and teaching at university level for 21 years. Sure. And what I realized when I decided to leave it, well, there were a few reasons why I left it, but one was because I realized people were more in their heads, and that's why their bodies were behaving the way they were. Mm. And so that led me uh, to follow one of my passions, another school degree, which was astrology, because I really love talking Mm -hmm. and talking to people. And so that took me to really pursuing astrology as a way and a tool for coaching. And so then I, in dealing with people's stresses, I realized, well, you know, let me explore some other ways to get into the state of meditation. Right. Because... Sure, the directions are easy. Sit up straight with your back straight, your spine and your head lifted so that you can really start to create some space in the body. Close your eyes. So far, so good, right? Real easy. Focus on the breath. Okay, that's where we lose some people. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the way I like to teach it is focus on the on the sensation of the breath coming in and out through the nose in the front inside edges of your nose. So stick your finger in your nose and find it. Get some friction there <laughs> and see if you can feel it. I've had people who are yogis tell me, I can't feel my breath there. Well, yeah. then do more things to get more in touch with your body. Put something cold, put something warm, you know. Uh, see if you can't get scratch, <laughs> you yeah. know, squeeze. See if you can get that attention. And then also a lot of times in the classical directions that have been translated, we'll see place the, uh, you know, focus the eyes on the central point, Ajna Chakra, the third eye. Well, but that's misleading too, because then I'm crossing my eyes up and... Trying to look at it. That doesn't, yeah, but what will happen is with the eyes closed and a gentle breath, the inner attention will be drawn either to the third eye or the heart. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Whichever, wherever you go, that's your point. That's your meditation central point. But then I teach centering, you know, I, I'm a, I teach, I teach meditation as a means to find intuition. Mm. And I just, earlier this year, I, I studied Bhagavad Gita with a monk from the ashram where I've lived and studied off and on over the years. And I feel very connected with the Bahamas campus of Shivananda Ashram. And I've been studying with a beautiful monk there every Monday night, the Bhagavad Gita. And it's been really helping my PTSD of what's been going on Mm. with this situation with the virus and everything in the world. And uh, so... 
I I just lost. Where was I going, Shane? I just got. <laughs> We're talking really, about. I went off in meditation for a second. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it came from you know people being too much in their head and needing to be more oh, connected right, right, right. with their bodies. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I oh so you know I, I teach at the Gray School of Wizardry. Mm. So Gray School of Wizardry spelled G R E Y, and find it at grayschool.net. And I originally came on thinking I would just rewrite the astrology uh, an astrology course and give it to them as a gift, and you know that would be that. Yeah. And then they said, "Well, you know, do you want to be more involved?" And I said, "Okay." <laughs> so I started leading a club. It was a divination club. It got really redundant. And during that point, they said, "Well, would you like to teach a class?" And I said, "Great, yeah." And uh, they gave me what's called core energy practices, and it topics of centering, mm -hmm. grounding, uh, tuning into your senses, and and cleansing. You know, cleansing your body, cleansing your energy space, cleansing your home shielding, protecting yourself, you know, be, from negativity and energy that comes at you and meditation. And I said, mm, yes, I will take that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so that's a two part, that's a two part class at our foundational first level. And I looked at the class and I said, may I rewrite this? Because I'm finding a lot of issues here. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the dean of curriculum was not an easy person. We have had two deans of curriculum since then. And the one I'm working with now is a delight, an absolute delight. And since then, I uh, after that, I became the dean of psychic arts. What did I do? I've written an entire major. And I said to my professor that I'm working on this PhD for, I'm teaching at a school of wizardry. And he was like, ah, you know, yeah. witchcraft, sorcery. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Wizard, different, different. Wise people, guess what, Shastri? Shastri is, is the title of professor. Mm. It's actually high esteem professor in Sanskrit. And I said, no, Shastriji, uh, this is actually kind of like yoga. It's, it's, it's like training yogis. There's, there's no attack going on here. And certainly not in the psychic arts department. It's all about protection, centering. I told him all of that. And he went, okay, let's see what you write. And I, I, uh, rewrote those first level classes, and then I started writing what I believe to be an entry level meditation class. Yes, because the headmaster over on Zell Ravenheart had written in his grimoire for the apprentice wizard a section on meditation, and I, you know, they were coming from a different grouping of individuals getting into meditation. Yeah. I actually had one of them say to me. Wasn't it the Beatles who brought meditation to the United States? <laughs> Where does it even come from? Oh my goodness! And I, you know, I said, "Well, okay, that's great. Yep." And they were part of creating awareness, <laughs> but I can give you more back history. <laughs> and uh, and then just recently, the I went to the monk that I'm studying with, and I said, "Ask Swami G because she's the attendant for the head Swami mm -hmm. at the Bahamas campus." So she can actually, she makes his dinner and I know he likes to eat. <laughs> and I said, could you ask Swamiji uh, to answer a question? There was a Thanksgiving thing last year where they, they took questions from the audience, but because I was in class, I could put a question in. Mm -hmm. And she said, Swamiji, what is intuition? And he said something so beautiful that I use now. He said, meditation is the ladder we must climb to reach intuition. And I was like, smack on. This is why I want to write. You know, this is why I wrote and published. I published uh, a, an eight-section class to create a major in meditation in the psychic arts department. Hmm. And I'm just now having, I just now have my very first apprentice. We call our students apprentices. I have my very first apprentice in the sixth level class. At the seventh level, they do a practicum. Wow. So they have to write a paper. They have to come up with it. But... It's so exciting to watch her because there's a course in it that is about your voice. It's about sound and breath. And then I teach you shape, body. Mm -hmm. And then I teach you manifestation. And everything is about intuition and teaching this. And then a couple weeks ago, I after watching the Lost History of Flat Earth, and I gave it, I gave it to the monk. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was Check like, can you out. watch this? I need to talk to you about this. <laughs> and, uh, and then after class this past um, two weeks ago, I said, uh, the, in, the, in the Bhagavad Gita, there's talk of three worlds and there's talk of seven worlds. And I said, I need a visual. Can you ask Swamiji, what does it look like? And the I was pretty sure the answer would come back cryptic. Mm. And the way the way she and she shared it with me after class this week, and she said, "Well, what Swamiji said is that it's it's intangible in our human senses." And I said, "Yeah, I get that. You know, it's energetic, and uh, we talk about layers of the body." I, you know, people talk about auras. Mm-hmm. That's just part of a, a layer. Sure. We have multiple layers that on some people can go out huge. I mean, think of great speakers, you know, and their energy, how it can go even beyond the auditorium. Yeah. Or, or beyond the moment in history. And propagates uh, through time. I, I said, okay, okay, I, I get that, you know, but I'm still on a quest because I think of those drone pictures from that. And looking at all these spectacular gardens, like at Versailles, and you can see their yantras, you know, sound. And then if you think of churches and their domes, and then the spire, and why is the bell in there? These were generators. Yeah. Generators. So, mm, yeah. Yeah. Think about cosmic geometry and how it generates. I I have, back to aliens. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, I can I can grab something. Oh, I don't know if my headphones will reach. Maybe if I'm lucky. Let's. Well, I'll have to show it to you after the show. Sure. I'll have to show it to you after the show, Shane. Um, but I I went through a period of uh, living in Scottsdale. There's a lot of UFO conventions there, mm-hmm. and uh, I was invited to meet a very famous abductee because he wanted me to read his astrology chart. Oh, that's interesting. His name is Travis Travis Walton. Oh, yeah. And you might have seen the Hollywood movie Fire in the Sky. Yeah. And when I met him, it was years past the event. He was a keynote speaker. There was uh, also another keynote speaker who used to work for Waring. And uh, I was fascinated to meet Travis, and he gave me a signed copy of his book, uh, which is fantastic. If you did like the movie or you're into communion, you know, Whitley, Whitley Stryber's book, um, I highly recommend reading Fire in the Sky. And Travis was really, really frustrated, not only about being abducted, but not, not being believed. Mm-hmm. He was still troubled by this, and he was really not happy with the Hollywood movie. He said when we had our session, you know, he told me that, at first, he was happy, but then it took a turn, and he had no control over it, and it just left him really frustrated. He didn't like the way it portrayed him and his and his team, yeah, because he was part of a crew that was clearing brush uh, for this uh, for the power lines. And uh, I said, Travis, you've got to make a documentary. You know, that's the only way you're going to heal this, and he did. Yeah. So you can find his documentary now too. And it, it was really about proving the point because those guys were forced into multiple lie detection tests. And back then, that was brutal. Yeah. That was brutal. I think the equipment's a little kinder now. Yeah. Maybe not, but they were getting shocked and, you know, it was bad. And, uh, and defamed by, you know, various government entities and news outlets and public, right. public and opinion. Th- yeah, if you want a really great movie, everybody, watch The Eleventh Green. Have you seen that one, Shane? No, is it good? Ooh, put that on your list. What is it? And then we have to get... Promise me you'll get back together with me and talk about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. It's, a, it's not a high-budget Hollywood movie. You know, it's a little bit lower budget. And it's about a reporter that goes back to the Southwest because his father had passed away who had been involved in government. Mm. And he uncovers all this information about alien contact. So if you're one of one right of the on. people that love that, then I do. Yeah, I think you're. I want to get together with all of you. Can we all have a Zoom <laughs> yeah. and talk about it? I would love, love, love it. So I also wanted to talk to this this engineer who used to work for Waring. Mm. And at the time, I knew that I knew the name Waring for blenders. Like when I was growing up, there were Waring blenders. I didn't know Waring made stealth jet engines and all kinds of stuff. And this guy had been invited to Area Fifty One. Cool. 
I, I knew Einstein had been invited there, but I was like, and I'm an Einstein freak, yeah. everybody, like serious Einstein freak. And I, I really wanted to talk to him too, because I had created images in computer drafting that I was sure had something to do with zero gravity. Hmm. And he looked at them and he said, yeah, I think you're onto something. Wow. It's just, yeah, I promise I'll share them with yeah. you. And I, I had this idea that to steer an anti-gravity or even create the anti-gravity for liftoff, that you would place, that a being would place their hands on these images or something like them. And, and then because their body was like a conductor and a generator, and then with sound, they could actually levitate and create liftoff. Yeah. And, and uh, he, he concurred. He was like, yep, you are definitely onto something. And in his keynote, he talked about this piece of metal that he had been given from Area 51 that was very unusual, mm. that no matter how he cut it up or damaged it, it would <laughs> reconstruct back into the original piece with glyphic writing on it. Cool. I wish I had a photo of that. Yeah. And we didn't have cell phones that took pictures <laughs> back then. Eh. Yeah. What can I say? It, <laughs> There's a lot of things I wish I had images of that I've seen over the decades. Yeah. But but that was fascinating. And then I think about sea cucumbers. You know, they can do that. What do you mean? They, you, can, you can blend a sea cucumber in seawater with a stick blender, mm. and it'll reconstruct itself later. So cool. I make it a point not to eat sea cucumber. <laughs> Just in case it re-blends inside of you. It's not a creature you. I want to eat. It's not a cucumber, everybody. <laughs> and then did you did you see a couple days ago the three-eyed shrimp, Shane? No, what's that? Okay, you have to follow my Instagram okay. account. <laughs> and my Facebook account. Um, what happened was, well, I lived in the desert for 10 years. And something magical in the desert is monsoon season yeah. because... There can be torrential rains and dust storms. Have you ever seen a dust storm or been in one? No, I mean, only on TV, but... One of the scariest freaking things I've ever been in. I'm sure. Uh, because when I, when I, when you go, when you move to Arizona like I did and you go to get your driver's license, they give you a speech about dust storms. Wow. Before they hand you your license. Here's what you do in a dust storm. So within weeks, I moved there in July, which is monsoon season. Mm -hmm. Within weeks, I was driving home one day to my apartment and I see one coming from the Superstition Mountains. And it's just like you see in the movies. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what did they tell me <laughs> at, the, at the DMV? All right, pull over as far off the road as you can get and turn your lights off. Why? Because if your lights are on, somebody will think you're on the road moving and slam into you. Oh, okay. I see. So you get the heck off the road, off into the desert as far as you can get, or the shoulder if that's all that's available, yeah. and turn your lights out, which is scary because you're sitting there, dust storms pounding you, right? And you you got your lights off. Wow. So what? So what's it like? How long does it last? Because it looks like just a wall of. It's a wall of, dust. of voodoo yeah. coming at you, and it like, it just keeps moving. Right. It's and it's so big. Like even on an IMAX screen, it doesn't no. near give you the veracity and velocity of the thing. Yeah. No, I, I imagine. Um, and dust devils are really weird too. You know, these like little the spinny things. tornadoes yeah. that'll just kind of crop up. Those are freaky as heck. Yeah. Very, very Just freaky. like, where did that come from? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. But a dust storm so must be quite something to be in. But I guess it's you're lucky if you're in a car, right? If, you're, if right, you don't right, have right. anything, it's a or different inside, story. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to be out walking because you'll get pummeled because there's a lot of gravel involved. Oh, right. Fortunately, the times I, the ti that time, it was more dust than gravel. Mm -hmm. So my car didn't get chipped up. You know, maybe a couple little dings. But uh, I've seen, in the desert, I've seen hail balls the size of softballs. I mean, yeah. In the it's desert? It's crazy. Mm hmm. So much for deserts yeah. being, you know, dry. I've seen snow on. I've seen snow on saguaro cactuses. I've seen it snow in Phoenix. Wow. Yeah. So what a weird world. Don't. What a weird world. What a fascinating world. Yeah. But anyway, a couple days ago, back to I sidetracked yeah. Debbie. Please forgive me, or stay with me, everybody. No, we're so good. the other day, I see this. I see this article about a three-eyed shrimp. Hmm. 
three eyed shrimp. What do I see in my mind right away? You know, the the fish with three eyes from The Simpsons. Right. right? I'm thinking, wow, this is just really freaky. So I go and look and I'm like, that is not a shrimp. That looks like a an alien horseshoe crab. And I always have thought horseshoe crabs are aliens anyway. And they they have blue blood. And why are we using parts of them in vaccines? So I thought it was very freaky that and that's that's truth, everybody. Why are we using horseshoe crab stuff in vaccines? I don't know. And then I see this three-eyed shrimp that really is a miniature three-eyed something crab. that looks like a horseshoe crab. Yeah. And and the story was that uh, in, a, in an area where there's a big park where there used to be a ball court, so I'm guessing from an ancient tribe mm-hmm. in the desert, that there had been a monsoon and some water had puddled. And then a really big monsoon came through and really poured a lot of gallons. And a park ranger was out with a group, la, 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 and this is the ball court. Wait a minute. And they see all these things. I would love to see a video of it because all I got was a still picture of the creature in the ranger's hand. But I, I imagine in my mind, were they flipping around? Were they just swimming? You know, were they floating? Were they backstroking? What were they doing? And how'd they get there? How long were they? Well, apparently, you know, science says, well, you know, this is a type of creature that can stay dormant in the dirt for blah, blah, many years, which I also have a hard time understanding with locusts yeah. and such. That's weird. Uh, or fish falling from the sky, it's true. which I have seen catfish here in Florida where they shouldn't be. And I don't know if it was because a fisherman threw it, which is mean. Stop doing that. And, uh, or did they fall because it was after a rainstorm and I came across a few of these very weird looking black catfish. Um, cool. And I, I know there's stories of frogs falling and, you know, all, all kinds of weird of things, stuff. Yeah. So apparently what science says is these creatures can just stay dormant for a really super long time. And then if there's sufficient rain, they'll come up. Hmm. You know, they'll, they'll reemerge. That's an interesting theory. That What's your theory on it? I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to go talk to the three-eyed shrimp. Yeah, I'd like to. I would like to get science to name that something else. Yeah, I, I, it's misleading. I, yeah, but it does have three eyes, and then I, I love how we're told, you know, how creatures see or what they think. Yeah, because I would rather have the creature tell me. Yeah, that would be nice. You know, why that, yeah. you know, what is that creature doing with two eyes that look like they're seeing and a third eye? How interesting. A creature with a third eye pops up during this situation. Yeah. Very strange. You know? Or like there's that, um, there's that thing I saw. I think it's shrimps or, or some sort of crustacean that have like 12 rods and cones in their eyes where we only have three or something like that. And so they can see you know, spectrums far beyond what any other animal known can. Right. I mean, what's that like? They can see, well, sense everything almost, not everything, but a lot more, right? Go down to South America where I used to te- take people on healing trips, yeah. architectural and healing trips, and go to where you can drink huachuma for, and it's legal. Go to where you can drink ayahuasca and it's legal and do it with proper shaman. Mm. Stop doing it recreationally. Yeah. Because <laughs> not a good you're idea. missing it. You're missing it. You're you might get a sensation. You might see the the Shipibo type stitchery moving and uh the fractals and the colors. The colors are amazing, Shane. They are beyond hmm. what we can see. And you can see these with your inner sight. You can see these in meditation, but you have to have a steady practice for a long time. Mm. I mean, it's going to take you a good three and a half years of everyday practicing till you could even miss a day and still be able to go back into that deep state. And after, I've been practicing since 1966, do the math. Yeah. Right? And I've been teaching since 1977. Wow. And just recently... I feel like I pick up on some of those colors. Cool. Is it because I have partaken in this plant medicine with proper shaman? I don't know. 
it's very purgative. And so if you're doing it recreationally and you're not purging, are you really getting the full effect? And I'll tell you what else. Back to sound and vibration, Shane. Yeah. The ceremony is not just about the plant. It's about the shaman singing to you and leading you mm. and healing you. Because I was at a ceremony where this shaman, there was a lot of music. This shaman had also a, a dear friend of mine uh, who I'm connected with on, on social media, and he does amazing what I would call DMT art. Mm. Like, phew, they're animated now, and cool. it's like, Every day is better. Yeah. It's like Alberto's Alberto's art and you'll see me share it in my uh in my stories sometimes. And uh he's an amazing musician and he we jammed one ceremony like um I, I wish it was recorded. Or maybe it sounded like crap and it was my imagination <laughs> that made it sound great, but it was magical. Wow. And there's and the shaman that he worked as an interpreter for, I speak Spanish, so I understood, because the shamans have Quechua as their language, but many of them have learned to speak Spanish. Mm. And uh, he came over. I was having an experience of being healed by all these little creatures, and I've drawn lots of pictures of them. I Again, I will share pictures with you when after the recording. Sure. I didn't know I needed all yeah. my stuff here. <laughs> uh, but... Um, it's not fair when people are listening in audio anyway. Uh, so I would draw lots of pictures. Mm. After the very first ceremony, I drew a lot of pictures. And it was his brother shaman, you know, from his lineage. They learned and studied and grew up mm -hmm. to become these amazing uh, keros is actually the proper term. It's not shaman, but most people don't know that word. So they became keros together. And the one is very well known for his singing. Mm. And the singing creates like a dream spell. And so he came over to me during this, ex this ceremony, and I'm having this experience of things crawling all over my body and, and healing me, you know? And they're singing to me. Wow. Before he came over, they're singing to me, and they're going, we help, we help, we heal, we heal. You know, and we fix, we fix. And I was like, wow. And then he came over and they, st and as he came over, the little creatures in my imagination were singing, my queen, my queen, we heal you. And he started singing in Spanish the same thing. Now, how did he pick that up? <laughs> I don't know. That's something and else. And what he sang inspired some purging from mm. me, which, which took what my imagination and my experience was doing and then accelerated the healing that much more wow. and the experience that much more. It's amazing. I, I've had experiences where I imagined something. I one time I imagined, <laughs> this one's great. I imagined I became Ganesha, the elephant god <laughs> from the Far East right. that the Hindus, the Hindus love, but he's, you don't have to be a Hindu to, to, relate to these what i call the facets of the one mm -hmm. because we're all part of that one we're all little chips we're little holographic chips we're all part of the same one energy yeah uh, at a soul level or spirit level whichever word you like better and in my very first ayahuasca ceremony i became ganesha and i floated up and then ganesha kind of separated out and I was dancing as Ganesha with Ganesha and then I became like a winged unicorn and wow. then I took my hoof and I sliced my third eye area of my unicorn body open and the eye opened and when I came out of this hours later mm. I had a slit but I don't I mean how would I have cut myself I had a I had created a little cut in my head wow I have a divot there, you can see. I actually have one of those foreheads that's very rare. It's a skull structure where my frontal is two pieces. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's 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 a particular like DNA thing. Hmm. So can <laughs> yeah. can you feel it? <laughs> yeah. Like oh yeah, you can you can see you can see the crease right right, right in the center of my forehead. So don't worry, everybody. There's lots of videos of me online. <laughs> you can see it when I when I go like this. You can see it. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah but it it follows. It's a suture. Mm. You know, the skull, the skull. is not. It, 
yeah, but in in humans, this is usually a singular bone. But there are certain types of you know Situations. lineages yeah. that that have this two part. And uh, Oberon, the the headmaster of Grey School, he used to make unicorns. He used to breed unicorns, and they were a particular type of goat. Mm. He did a lot of research on magical beasts. That's one of his passions. And cool. they they looked at all these ancient paintings and writings, and he and his wife at the time, who is, has transformed, she's no longer living, um, they decided they were going to try and breed unicorns. And so what they would do is when the baby goat of this particular long-legged goat was born, they would massage the their like little seeds that goats are born with where their horns will be. Yeah. They would massage them uh, together. And and then within 24 hours, they would become unified because they, they solidify that fast in a baby goat, in a baby Whoa. creature that, that potentially grows horns. Huh. And... And they would grow a singular horn. And uh, unicorn goats. Barna- Who knew? Yeah, they actually. Yeah, they actually used to uh, be a part of a circus and Renaissance fairs. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> and they would groom them and 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 clip their coats in such a way that they would have long fetlocks like horses. And because of the weight of the horn being central, it would make their necks more horse-like, hmm. you know, and have that curve and that muscle. But they were aggressive, you know, and they had a hard time keeping them. They could bash their way with that singular yeah. horn out of stalls, and it was they were it was difficult. And goats for, like to do know. that, right? They bash yes, their heads. Yes, I on mean, things. I I had a friend who raised goats years and years ago, and he would call me when the babies were born because, come on, baby animals, yeah. don't you want to go touch the baby animal and play with the baby animals? Nothing better. And just watch them. Nothing better. Nothing better than furry little yeah. creatures. And uh, and I was playing with a baby goat that I had met the day they were born, and they were maybe a week later, right? And he was learning how to butt, you know? And he was butting my hand, butting yeah. my hand, and smarty me, I decided to put my head down. He butt oh. me. He knocked me back. This is a one-week-old goat. Yeah. I, I'm pretty that sure was a I had a slight concussion. <laughs> Don't do that. Just you know, like their heads are designed I've for learned it. not to do that, not to put my tongue in the in the socket on the wall, and I still touch the stove sometimes when it's yeah. hot. What's up with that? But, just checking, you know. You know? I, <laughs> yeah, I guess. You just got to see what's. <laughs> I going haven't done on. that in a long time, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Ambrika, this has been a really great episode. I've loved it. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, please plug whatever you want. You've got that event coming up. Let us know where oh, we can yes. find you. Yes, um, we've got an event that's hosted by Vidara, which is called Awakening Joy. And you can find Vidara at V-E-D-A-R-A dot org. That's V-E-D-A-R-A dot org. And the best way to find me is through my link tree. So if you're familiar with link tree, it's just slash my name, Ambika Devi, A-M-B-I-K-A-D-E-V-I. I'll spell it one more time. My first name, Ambika, A-M-B-I-K-A, and my last name, Devi, which means goddess. Uh, I was given the name, D-E-V-I. And you can also find me at myname.com and find your way into all of my other things. I'm in reconstruction on that site. Awakening Joy is going to be November 13th and 14th, and I'll be a keynote speaker talking about joy. And I'm giving a workshop that weekend, an in-person live workshop, in person, virtual, yeah, <laughs> live, <alive>. um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that I will be teaching breathing and sound techniques. Cool. So that so that you can calm your mind, and these are what in my research all these years, all these decades, are the fastest and most powerful tools to launch yourself right instantly into the state of meditation. So I'm going to teach this as an experimental. Workshop, meaning you are the scientist, you're experimenting, and you can judge it and give feedback just the way science should be taught, Yeah, you know, instead of giving us theories and we're supposed to believe it. I'm going to let you prove it. Uh, So that I'm really excited about. I've got my new book coming out 
Uh, it's about love, and I'm planning on launching it on Valentine's Day. Nice. And on my link tree, you can see recent, uh, recent interviews, and sometimes I let some stick because they might really have some impact, and Shane's will be up there <laughs> at, at some point, and uh, windows into all these other things that I do. So I look forward to having you make an appointment with me. You can engage me as an astrologer, a coach, a writing coach, a life coach, uh, a relationship coach, a communication coach. Maybe you want to speak or learn how to make videos or, you know, how to, how to do this, like whatever I'm doing, I'm happy to teach you. And I just want to thank you all for listening all the way to the end. And thank you, Shane. Yeah. It's been a blast. It's been great. And thank you again. <laughs> lots of rabbit holes. Lots yeah. of them. <laughs> it's been great. And I, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Until then, take care. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye.